Greetings everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Shah and I currently work as an intern. Since the past few days I had been receiving a few queries from my friends in subordinate batches as regards the impending university examinations and I couldn't stress enough the importance of solving MCQs especially when they make up a major chunk close to 20% of your marks in your final university examination. And nothing is as satisfying as knowing that you have objectively answered them and quite a few of them would be correct. And coming out of the exam hall, knowing that feels great and it would give you a sense of confidence for your next papers. So I was not able to uh, solve all of the uh, MCQs or discuss them uh, with many of my friends. So some of them told me to come up with this virtual format. And uh, so without further ado, I would like to, you know, start the MCQ discussion for the second year and uh, we'll be focusing. I, I'm hoping to do majority of them. Maybe I can't promise that I'll do them all, but uh, maybe this is the first step, but few disclaimers before starting. Uh, it is not to be confused with neat exam prep or neat level MCQs because it's a different ball game altogether. Secondly, I have not written all the explanations down because it was humanely not possible for me to write them down single-handedly. And uh, thirdly, uh, I've included the MCQs from the year 2010 up to 2017. For the last four years, I did not have them. Uh, so if you get them, I'll uh, mention my email ID in the link below and you could mail them and hopefully we could discuss them as well. Without further ado, let's start with second day MCQ discussion. And uh, we'll start with pathology because uh, that's a very scoring subject and uh, there's a very high chance of accuracy if you know the basic concepts. So let's start. Uh, so the first chapter is introduction to pathology, cellular injury, adaptations and cell death. First question asked was, who is the father of pathology? So it's pretty straightforward. The answer is B, Rudolf Virchow. So Rudolf Virchow is the father of cellular pathology. He brought forward the concept that uh, all diseases originate at the cellular level and a disbalance or an imbalance in homeostasis at the cellular level leads to cellular injury and disease. Uh, the remaining options, Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek uh, is known as uh, the person who founded the microscope. Edward Jenner is uh, responsible for developing the first vaccine against cowpox and uh, first vaccine against smallpox using the cowpox virus. And Louis Pasteur is responsible for the process of pasteurization and introducing the concept of germ theory of disease and also the concepts of fermentation and sterilization, right? So next question, what is the most common cause of cell injury? Now it's a, again, a favorite question, uh, either in your vivas, either in uh, the MCQ questions, most common cause of any cellular injury is hypoxia. And most common cause of hypoxia is ischemia. Ischemia is reduced blood supply. Right. All the remaining ones are also causes of cell injury, but the most common cause is hypoxia. So what would hypoxia lead to? Hypoxia would lead to decreased oxidative phosphorylation and thereby a decrease in ATP. So the cell would move from oxidative phosphorylation towards glycolysis. And in glycolysis, there will be anaerobic respiration and there will be acidosis or a decrease in pH of the cell. So always remember most common cause of cell injury is hypoxia and most common cause of hypoxia is ischemia or diminished blood supply. Third is dystrophic calcification is seen in all except. Now, uh, I'm, I forgot to mention it earlier. All the MCQs which I have included are in a random fashion. I did not organize them in specific subsets because the MCQs which would be asked in your exams would also be in a random fashion. It would not be organized serially. So I want you to get used to it, right? So dystrophic calcification is seen in all except. Now there's this concept of pathological calcification. So calcification is deposition of calcium. It can be dystrophic, it can be metastatic. Dystrophic, remember the word D and remember the word dying. So in dead, dying tissues or damaged tissues, dead, dying, damaged tissues, all you would have is dystrophic calcification. So your blood calcium levels or serum calcium levels are normal. 
but they are being deposited in those areas where there is cellular death. As opposed to that, we have metastatic calcification. In metastatic calcification, the serum levels of calcium are high. So that is, there is hypercalcemia. And that calcium is being deposited in normal tissues. So dystrophic calcification, serum calcium normal, deposited in dead or dying tissues. Metastatic calcification is, your serum calcium is high and it is being deposited in normal tissues. So now it is written, the question asked is, dystrophic calcification is seen in all except. So TB lymph node, would you see? Yes. Gastric mucosa, normal gastric mucosa. Let's see. Gamma gandhi body and atheromatous plaque. Now, if you know, TB lymph node is an example of caseous necrosis. So in necrosis, a dying tissue, would you have deposition of calcium? Yes, and it will be dystrophic. Gamma Gandhi bodies are seen in CVC spleen. It's also a form of dystrophic calcification. You should know that. Atheromatous plaque, yes, there's formation of atheromas. Again, there's deposition of calcium. Calcification of those plaques because again, there's cellular death. Now, gastric mucosa is normal. So you would not see dystrophic calcification there. You would see metastatic calcification because your serum calcium would be high, but it is being deposited in normal tissues. So this question has been repeated umpteen number of times. Where would you see dystrophic? Where would you see metastatic? Always remember dystrophic will be seen in those where you have any kind of injury, right? Where there is cellular damage. Whereas metastatic would be seen in normal tissues, but there's increased calcium due to other causes, right? Next question is, apoptosis is inhibited by, again, it's a very, very important concept. There's this concept of pro-apoptotic and anti-apoptotic genes, right? So you have specific uh, mediators or specific markers such as, or proteins. So you know that BCL2, MCL1 and BCLXL right, BCL2, BCL, uh, MCL1, and BCLXL, all of them are anti-apoptotic genes. They are anti-apoptotic genes. And BAC and BACs, BAK and BAX are pro-apoptotic genes. Always remember, BAX, BAK, something which is very bad, right? So that is pro-apoptotic. BCL2, MCL1, BCLXL, all of them are anti-apoptotic. Again, there's a concept of tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes. So oncogenes will promote oncogenesis, which is cancer formation. Tumor suppressor genes will prevent oncogenesis. That means it will promote apoptosis, right? So the question asked is, apoptosis is inhibited by. So I told you that the anti-apoptotic proteins are PCL2, MCL1, and BCLXL. So the option is D. Now the remaining three, P53, NMIC, and RAS. All of them are, all of them are, right? They are pro-apoptotic. Why? Because they are tumor suppressor genes. You do not want your cancer to proliferate. That's why these are tumor suppressor or pro-apoptotic. So P53 is known as a guardian of genome. Then you have NMIC and then you have RAS, HRAS, KRAS, NRAS, multiple RAS. So all of them are pro-apoptotic, but anti-oncogenic or tumor suppressor. Whereas BCL2 is pro up, BCL2 will inhibit apoptosis, right? Always remember. Wear and tear pigment. So calcification concept we have seen, apoptosis concept we have seen, pigment concept. So there's this pigment which is called as lipofusin. So lipofusin or lipochrome is the product of lipid peroxidation or end products of lipid peroxidation. As and when you age, there is always free radical mediated injury, which will result in lipid uh, deposition or lipid product deposition. And lipofusin is one such product. So the wear and tear pigment is known as lipofusin. Generally, it is seen in the heart and in the brain. And uh, it is known as senile atrophy, senile atrophy of the brain or brown atrophy of the heart. You'll see this, uh, these questions again and again when you uh, go through your past year MCQs. Uh, brown atrophy of heart or senile atrophy of brain or wear and tear pigment. All of these terms are used for lipofusin and uh, it is perfectly physiological. It does not cause any pathological harm, right? It is lipofusin is uh, deposited as 
yellowish brown granules and the location is perinuclear always remember perinuclear location wear and tear pigment yellowish brown or golden brown right uh the next question is barrel c sophagus is an example of again a highly tested area and that is the answer is metaplasia right so what's metaplasia metaplasia is change in the lining of an epithelium by epithelium or change in lining by another epithelium or lining which is better suited to withstand that particular adverse effect or adverse conditions so there are generally two kinds of metaplasia one is epithelial metaplasia and second is mesenchymal metaplasias so epithelial metaplasias can be either squamous or columnar now when you use the term squamous metaplasia or columnar metaplasia it refers to the final lining which has come in place of the earlier one so barrett's esophagus what happens your lower end of esophagus generally lined by stratified squamous epithelium but when there is chronic gastroesophageal reflux disease what would happen is there would be acid reflux so there will be continuous chemical injury now your stratified squamous epithelium is not able to withstand that stress so what happens is it is being replaced by another type of epithelium which is better suited to withstand that stress and that epithelium is intestinal columnar type of epithelium which has mucin so that will protect against the acid reflux and that is precisely known as barrett's esophagus now the co correlation ahead is they'll ask in uh, the chapter on esophagus and stomach that barrett's esophagus has an increased risk of which ca carcinoma squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma it would be adenocarcinoma why adeno because you have a change in lining from squamous to columnar right columnar with mucin so it, it does form mucin producing glands so it has an increased risk for obvious adenocarcinoma because adenocarcinoma is a glandular carcinoma right so that is barrett's esophagus the next is which condition is associated with dystrophic calcification again they have asked so dystrophic is d4 dead dying or damaged so primary hyperparathyroidism will lead to increased serum calcium secondary hyperparathyroidism again increased serum calcium vitamin d intoxication increased serum calcium fat necrosis the calcium level will be normal obviously but there will be deposition of calcium at the areas of fat necrosis the common example is yeah in acute pancreatitis there is peripancreatic fat necrosis and deposition of calcium and calcium uh when it would react with uh, your fatty acids it will form soap right so it will have a gritty appearance right so that is fat necrosis primary hyperpar so options a b and c would be examples of metastatic calcification option d is dystrophic calcification which of the following is again pro apoptotic now as i mentioned earlier as well backs and back are pro apoptotic what is p53 p53 is a tumor suppressor gene that means it will promote apoptosis so all three of them are pro apoptotic so the answer is all of the above whereas bcl2 mcl1 and bcl xl are anti apoptotic genes right these these all are pro apoptotic genes cardiac amyloidosis often produces now i did not find any correlation here but the answer is restrictive cardiomyopathy so just remember that some questions are simply facts to be remembered and the university uh of late has been asking some questions which are having some clinical orientation but a major, major chunk of them still are from those which are purely facts and you need to remember them so cardiac amyloidosis often produces or its option b restrictive cardiomyopathy enzyme which prevents aging another important concept why does a person age or why does a cell age because with multiple replications the ends of the chromosome they shorten so your replication is not effective so that will again lead to free free radical oxygen damage so what happens is we have this enzyme which is called telomerase so why do stem cells not die because stem cells have an abundance of telomerase so what these cells would do what these enzyme would do is it would regenerate the ends of the chromosome which would prevent it from shortening so telomerase are enzymes which regenerate chromosomal ends prevent their shortening and prevent aging or promote immortality 
to be honest. So the enzyme which prevents aging is telomerase, whereas the enzyme catalase that is used for degrading hydrogen peroxide into two, uh, you know, free of two radicals of hydroxyl H2O2 giving uh, two OH uh, radicals. Superoxide dismutase is again a uh, an enzyme which uh, degrades uh, H2O2 into uh, H2O and O2. And mat matrix metalloprotease is an enzyme which degrades your collagen. So it is, it is elevated in inflammation or it is involved in inflammation. Telomerase is preventing aging, right? Diabetic food is an example of. Diabetic food is generally an example of wet gangrene. It's widely accepted that it's wet gangrene. There might be some, some uh, you know, uh, confusion that it could be dry gangrene as well. But uh, we assume that diabetic food having increased glucose levels or hyperglycemia is a fertile soil for getting infected. So it is always under the category of gangrene. So there are generally five or six types of necrosis, if I'm not wrong. One is coagulative necrosis. Most common cause of coagulative necrosis is basically ischemia. Ischemia in all solid organs will lead to coagulative necrosis. So if there's a question, there's a person who died of a heart attack and uh, his heart is sent for PM, what type of necrosis can you expect? Or if there's a person with, uh, you know, uh, an embolus in the renal artery, so there's a renal shutdown and the person eventually died of kidney failure. What kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, necrosis would you ex expect in the kidney specimen? Again, it would be coagulative necrosis. So coagulative necrosis, solid organs due to ischemia or lack of blood supply. The same ischemia in uh, organs which are semi-solid, example, brain, because brain has plenty of water and enzymes. So ischemia there causes enzymatic degradation. Uh, in coagulative necrosis, there is protein denaturation mainly. And in uh, liquefactive necrosis, there is enzymatic degradation. So your brain will undergo liquefactive necrosis. So when coagulative necrosis occurs in, uh, you know, end organs such as the distal feet or uh, hands or the distal limbs that will be referred to as dry gangrene when it is uh, complicated by super added infection it will result in enzymatic degradation which will result in wet gangrene Gra gas gangrene is because of uh, clostridium welchi and uh, necrotizing inflammation is a very generalized term uh, such as fourniers gangrene so that gangrene is an example of necrotizing inflammation uh, the next type of uh, necrosis is fat necrosis, as I already mentioned, uh, in acute pancreatitis or traumatic uh, injury to the breast. Any, any tissue which has a lot of fat in it will undergo fat necrosis. Then you have fibrinoid necrosis that is basically due to deposition of uh, antigen-antibody complexes and eventually there is fibrin-like product. It is not fibrin. But there's increased vascular permeability due to cellular damage and there's an eosinophilic material which is deposited. Examples are ash of nodules, uh, endromatic fever, and you have polyarthritis nodosa as well, right? So let's go to the next one. Myocardial infarction is which type of necrosis? As I already mentioned, it is coagulative necrosis. Equifactive necrosis, brain, or any abscess or pus, that is liquefaction. Gangrenous is again, it will depend, it, is it wet or it is dry? Caseous necrosis, yeah, we forgot caseous. Caseous necrosis is seen in places or caseous necrosis is typically limited to tuberculosis because your tuberculous bacilli, it resists degradation or it resists elimination. That will result in a chronic inflammation and there'll be formation of tubercles. And that, that cheesy material is, it's a cheese-like material which is formed. In, the, in those tubercles, that is known as caseous necrosis. Always remember, caseous necrosis is very, very important from the histological perspective. What would you see in, uh, you know, a TB lymph node or uh, basically TB lymphadenitis? They'll generally ask in histology, so always remember that. Or TB lung, right? So you'll see a central zone of uh, caseous necrosis. Followed by them, you'll have a. Uh, uh, giant cells and mononuclear infiltrate followed by that you have lymphocytic collar and finally you have fibroblasts right russell's body are seen in now what are russell's body russell's bodies are basically 
seen in plasma cells. So Russell's bodies are uh, aggregation of immunoglobulins. Plasma cells generally secrete immunoglobulins. What plasma cells are? Plasma cells are basically activated B cells. So they'll secrete immunoglobulins. So in, for example, uh, in a condition called as multiple myeloma, multiple myeloma is a plasma cell dyscrasia. There's abnormal plasma cells, which will produce a lot of immunoglobulins. Again, with respect to multiple myeloma, there's uh, MCQ asked, which is lens Jones proteins are seen in urine in multiple myeloma. And plasma cells also secrete a lot of immunoglobulins. So uh, the bodies which are, the inclusions which are there in plasma cells, these are known as Russell's bodies, right? So remember that. Mast cells, generally they will secrete histamine and they have basophilic bodies. RBC won't have any inclusion. WBC is a generalized term. Next is liquefactive necrosis is common in. As I already mentioned, liquefactive necrosis, always remember brain, so liquefactive necrosis is common in GIT. Program cell death. Program cell death is known as apoptosis. Apoptosis also means in Greek, which is falling off of a leaf. They like to ask that a lot, but I doubt it will be asked you know, in these exams and exams nowadays, but it's good to remember apoptosis, program cell death or falling off of a leaf. Rabid uterus is an example of. Now we'll move towards cellular adaptations. So uh, in response to any acute stress before undergoing injury, a, a cell will try to adapt to it. So what is adaptation? Adaptation is a reversible change in either the size, the structure, the phenotype, the function, the metabolic activity of a cell, which helps the cell to withstand those adverse conditions which can be either a physiological stress or any pathological stimulus. So that is known as adaptation. Now, gravid uterus, what happens is earlier or in the initial time, uh, there is uh, instrogenic stimulation. So there is hyperplasia, there is uh, hypoplasia of the myometry. But as the fetus expands, it also leads to stretch and that stretch leads to hypertrophy of the smooth muscle cells. So it is an example of both hyperplasia and hypertrophy. So this MCQ per se is not pathologically correct, but the best answer would be hypertrophy because overall when you see, you'll have large plump smooth muscle spindles uh, shaped smooth muscle cells. Hyperplasia is just seen initially. So gravid uterus or uh, breast during you know, puberty and lactation, both are examples of hyperplasia and hypertrophy. You cannot differentiate, but a better answer would be hypertrophy. I hope that clears the confusion. So hypertrophy is increase in cellular size, trophy is size, plasia is cell number, so increase in cell number, atrophy is decrease in size and cellular number, metaplasia is change in the phenotype, meta is to change something, right, metaverse. Pigment deposited in brown atrophy of heart, as I already mentioned, that's lipofusin, parent hair pigment. Metastatic calcification primarily involves now that would involve a normal mucosa so again gastric mucosa is an example of a normal tissue aortic valves they should have mentioned degenerated aortic valves soft tubercles atheromas all of them are tissues which are damaged right so they'll have dystrophic calcification gastric mucosa being normal it will have metastatic calcification uh false about fatty change of liver alcohol abuse is the common cause that's true Often a form of reversible injury, that's true as well. Fat is demonstrated by frozen section, that's true. Uh, generally, they'll ask stains for fat. Which are the stains for fat? They'll So you'll have to answer. It's oil red O, Sudan 3, Sudan 4, and Sudan black. Yeah, oil red O, Sudan 3, Sudan 4, and Sudan black. And demonstrated by frozen section. So the machine used is cryostat. And the temperature is generally in the range of minus 25 to minus 35 degrees. So intraoperative frozen sections using cryostat, demonstration of fat. Uh, predominant accumulation of cholesterol. So this option is incorrect. In fatty change, you'll have accumulation of triglycerides, TGs, right? So TGs are basically esters of fatty acids and glycerol. It is not associated with cholesterol. So this is an incorrect option. So option D is incorrect. Word which predominantly means falling off or drooping off. It's my bad. Dropping off. That would be apoptosis. Necrosis, we know. Uh, what is necroptosis? What is pyroptosis? Uh, 
these are new terms which have been added in the uh, latest edition of robbins so necroptosis is basically necrosis which is programmed it is basically necrosis which is programmed and it is a caspase independent form of cellular death you only need to remember this and it is through enzymes rip1 and rip3 so basically those are kinases so a necrosis which is programmed that is known as necroptosis what is pyroptosis pyroptosis is uh, in conditions where there is iron overload the cell, the form of cell death is pyroptosis iron overload pyroptosis right my bad a pyroptosis would be a uh, elimination after necrosis so that is pyroptosis so removal of dead and damaged tissues through the formation of an inflammasome that is known as pyroptosis ferroptosis is when you have an excessive accumulation of iron that will lead to again free radical damage fatty at, uh, fatty acid oxidation that is ferroptosis pyroptosis is removal of the dead tissues or the damaged tissues after necrosis via inflammasome and the enzymes involved are caspases 1 4 and 5 1 45 you can remember that way as well so it is also programmed positive dopa reaction so dopa reaction is given by melanocyte so uh, for demonstration of melanin pigment you use dopa reaction and there is also a stain called small stain s c h m o r l wherein the melanin will appear black here uh, dopa uh, reaction is given by melanocyte so uh, uh, the exact reaction you did not you did not know but always remember that dopa reaction is used for detection of melanin and it is shown by melanocytes intercellular cholesterol accumulation in macrophages of skin that is known as xanthoma now these options are very interesting uh cholesterol lysis is basically known as strawberry gallbladder when there is cholesterol deposition in gallbladder cholestatoma is related to uh your ear uh, where is it is known as glue ear and uh, xanthoma is basically when you have yellowish deposits or yellowish marks on your skin because those are basically cholesterol which is deposited in macrophages and the collection there is known as a xanthoma right so remember the answer is xanthoma granuloma is anything which is resisting degradation that will form a granuloma and infective granuloma is basically tuberculosis a non infective granuloma example is sarcoidosis right syphilis is also an example of a tuberculosis is also an example of an infective granuloma so uh, syphilis cryptococcus you know cryptococcus neoformans it's a fungal infection spirochetes infection tuberculosis infection granuloma formation ionic changes in intracellular compartment during cell injury so what happens during cell injury as i said there's decreased atp formation uh so there will be loss of the function of sodium potassium pump so what would happen is a lot three sodium would not be pumped outside two potassium not pumped inside so there will be a lot of accumulation of water but what would happen is your calcium pump would also not work so there will be an increased intracellular calcium why because the calcium outside is 2.4 milli equivalent inside is 0.001 but due to lack of energy or lack of atp this balance is lost and there is influx of calcium and influx of calcium is basically the key change which is responsible for you know initiating the cascade of downstream events which is activation of all the enzymes so increased calcium is responsible for cellular injury fragmentation of nucleus so what are the nuclear changes which you see when there is cell death So there are three changes. Always remember that first there is shrinkage of the nucleus that is known as pycnosis. Then there is fragmentation of the nucleus that is known as karyorexis. And finally the nucleus is dissolved that is known as karyolysis. So the sequence is pycnosis, karyorexis followed by karyolysis. I hope that is clear. The next question is Samoa bodies are seen in. Now this is again a favorite question and it is having a high chance of being you know repeated or coming in these years this year's examination i just have a better instinct maybe not let's see so samoa bodies are an example of dystrophic calcification right because there is 
cellular injury at that point. So any tumor, th these are specifically for tumors because you'll have whirls of, uh, you know, you'll have basophilic calcium deposition. Calcium always appears basophilic or blue under microscopy. And it is seen in only four or five tumors and you have to remember them by heart because they'll have three options which will have Samoa bodies and one which will not have. So you need to remember that. So uh, the question is Samoa bodies are seen in all except serous cyst adenocarcinoma ovary, yes. Papillary renal cell carcinoma, yes. Meningioma, yes. Papillary carcinoma thyroid, yes. So Samoa bodies are seen in all of them. And if there's an option of prolactinoma, that's true as well because Samoa bodies are seen in all. That was a trick question because I did not give an option of none. So all of them, serous cyst adenocarcinoma ovary, papillary renal cell carcinoma of papillary renal cell carcinoma, papillary thyroid cell carcinoma, and meningioma. All of them will have Samoa bodies. Always remember it, star mark this question. Cellular swelling and reversible injury is due to, as I mentioned, it is due to reduced ATP concentration. Your sodium potassium pump will not work. There will be influx of water. Calcium influx is due to loss of calcium exchanger pump and that will lead to activation of enzymes. And which are those enzymes? Lipases, basically phospholipases, proteases, right? And that will lead to further damage. Free radical injury, no. Decrease apolipo, no, not really. Example of metastatic calcification again, what would, be, what would it be? It would be hypoparathyroidism. Why? Because pancreatitis, inflammation, there'll be fat necrosis, yeah, peripheral fat necrosis. And in that, there'll be calcium deposition. Again, traumatic fat necrosis in breast, there'll be uh, dystrophic calcification. Atherosclerosis itself an example of dystrophic. Hypoparathyroidism, it would be metastatic calcification. And one of the common sites of metastatic calcification is gastric mucosa or capillaries of your lung, right? Lung and kidney. Condition associated with non-hemoglobin derived pigment Brown atrophy, connectors, jaundice, heart failure cells. Now, again, it's an important question because it relates to pigments. Now, connectors is because of deposition of bilirubin pigment in neonates. Jaundice, neonatal jaundice is basically connectors. Basically, when it reaches the central nervous system, it is known as connectors. Jaundice in general, again, bilirubin deposition. Heart failure cells. Now, heart failure cells are because of what do they contain? Heart failure cells contain hemosiderin. And what is hemosiderin? Hemosiderin is aggregation of ferritin. Right. And from where is this ferritin derived? Well, this ion is derived from breakdown of hemoglobin. So what happens is, in case of your left heart failure, there will be an increased back pressure. So there will be increased pressure in your pulmonary veins. That pulmonary veins will lead to increased pressure in your pulmonary capillary bed. And what will happen? This leads to chronic venous congestion of your capillary bed. So that will lead to accumulation of RBCs, which will be subsequently broken down by your macrophages. So then heme and globin, heme will further dissociate it into iron. Iron aggregates into ferritin. This ferritin is, you know, captured by your macrophages. And that is known as a heart failure cell because these are characteristic. And the stain you'll use for hemosiderin is pearls Prussian blue. This is also a favorite question. Stain used for hemosiderin is pearls Prussian blue. It will hemosiderin will appear dark blue or Prussian blue under the microscope. And brown atrophy, as I told, it was because of lipofusin, which has nothing to do with hemoglobin. It is because of lipid oxidation. Malarial pigment, which is a following, which of the following derivative of hemoglobin is a malarial pigment? So that is hemozoin. Hemosiderin, I mentioned what it is. Hemozoin is because of you know degradation or destruction of uh, RBCs by the malarial parasite, uh, specifically the trophozoite form, right? And what is hematin? Hematin is basically acid degradation of your hemoglobin. So when a person has bleeding from the GIT, so that's, that is known as, and when he vomits that out, that is known as hematemesis. So what happens is your acid of stomach, it degrades the uh, RBCs or it degrades the hemoglobin to form acid hematin. Uh, similarly, in our first year uh, practical exams for demonstration or estimation of hemoglobin content, we used to convert hemoglobin into acid hematin by N by 10 HCl. So that is the hematin. Hematin is acidic degradation. This is basically ferritin accumulation. 
hemozoin is a toxic form because of destruction of rbcs by the malarial parasite kidney infarct is an example of which type of necrosis again it is an example of coagulative necrosis collocative necrosis is also known as also known as liquefactive so there other, another name for liquefactive necrosis is collocative so if a short answer question comes uh, on collocative necrosis do not confuse it with coagulative necrosis as some of my batchmates uh, did uh, when it came in our uh, term examinations so collocative is basically liquid liquefactive necrosis tabby cat appearance of myocardium again it's an odd question but you should remember that tabby cat appearance is a striped pattern so what is a tabby cat go on google search and that is because of fatty degeneration of the heart always remember that cloudy change is because of reversible change reversible injury uh, which is you know influx of water so that is cloudy change highland degeneration are not applicable amyloidosis is also not applicable amyloidosis leads to restrictive cardiomyopathy right so fatty degeneration so we'll have alternate uh, bands of red and yellow heart so that is known as uh, tabby cat appearance and why specifically in myocardium because myocardium uses pfox enzyme and it uses lipids as its source of energy right dysplasia is characterized by now there are a few terms which i need you to be absolutely clear with uh, dysplasia is one of them so let's see the options decrease growth absence of cell atp and low ncn ratio loss of epithelial polarity now all these three options decrease growth absence of atp low ncn ratio these are all good things good characteristics loss of epithelial polarity is not a regular characteristic so dysplasia is disordered disordered growth is dysplasia so loss of epithelial polarity or loss of organization of cells that is known as dysplasia now metaplasia as i mentioned it was change in the phenotype of cells hyperplasia increase in size of cells dysplasia is disordered growth of cells and what is anaplasia anaplasia is lack of differentiation or cells which do not reflect or which do not resemble their parental cells they those are known as anaplastic cells or undifferentiated cells anaplasia and difference differentiation are inversely proportional if i say a tissue is highly anaplastic it means it is poorly differentiated so and dif differentiation is directly correlational to your uh, outcome so a poorly differentiated tumor will have a poor outcome so highly anaplastic is equivalent to poor differentiation is equivalent to poor outcome mild anaplasia that means very good differentiation very good outcome so loss of epithelial polarity is dysplasia brown atrophy of heart again that's because of lipofuscin so as you have seen it's being repeated multiple number of times so you need to be aware of that serum calcium levels are raised in i mentioned it is metastatic calcification for metaplasia which of the following is true as it disordered growth affects only epithelial cells reversible progressive and irreversible now disordered growth was dysplasia metaplasia is normal growth or it is orderly growth but it is just a change in lining affects only epithelial cells no it's incorrect as i mentioned earlier it can be an epithelial metaplasia and a mesenchymal metaplasia it can be both is it reversible yes because it's an adaptation adaptations are reversible changes so this is true progressive and irreversible it's false most important light microscopic feature of irreversible cellular injury so the question asked is light microscopy and irreversible cellular injury irreversible cellular injury always remember you will have specific nuclear changes which can be seen by a light microscope amorphous mitochondrial densities no you cannot visualize a mitochondria under light microscope so that is out of question membrane blebs and loss of microvilli again these are you know sub microscopic structures you cannot see them you cannot visualize them ribosomal detachment no you cannot but can you visualize the nucleus yes so in nuclear changes karyolysis what would be the sequence pycnosis karyorrhexis followed by karyolysis right atrophy is decrease in size of cells decrease in cell size number decrease change in phenotype or increase cellular of components so increase cellular of increase in synthesis of cellular components would have been hypertrophy change in cellular phenotype would be metaplasia decrease in cell size and number both is basically atrophy it is not only decrease in size of cells but decrease in cell size and number remember that
muscle hypertrophy change in myosin now this is a question directly out of robbins uh, because it's a straight line and you need to remember that and remember it alphabetically right muscle hypertrophy hypertrophy for that you need myosin because myosin will you know uh, actin and myosin both belong to the same category of filaments uh, which are microtubules uh, microfilaments but the important one is myosin so always remember it's myosin and what would be the change it would be a to b so it would be alpha to beta now would it be light or heavy remember it is heavy chain so alpha to beta heavy chain change in myosin is responsible for muscle hypertrophy which of the following do not undergo hyperplasia is it cardiac muscle skeletal muscle both not? now see smooth muscle undergoes hyperplasia and hypertrophy but cardiac and skeletal muscle only undergoes hypertrophy it does not undergo hyperplasia so it cannot divide so it cannot be replaced or replicated right so both of them both of them do not undergo hyperplasia they will under, undergo only hypertrophy metaplasia is seen in lungs of a smoker now i i mentioned metaplasia is change in lining which is better suited to the adverse condition so the normal lining of your lung is stratified pseudo stratified columnar ciliated but that cannot withstand the withstand the stress of the chemicals involved in smoking nicotine tar and you know, a billion of other chem chemicals so what it does is there is a change in lining it needs to be stratified rather than pseudo stratified so there will be a change in lining from pseudo stratified columnar to stratified squamous so the answer would be columnar to stratified squamous Vitamin responsible for metaplasia again it's written vitamin A deficiency or vitamin A excess both of them can lead to metaplasia so the answer is vitamin A anaplasia refers to a lack of differentiation I mentioned it variation in cell size and shape that is known as polymorphism that is known as cellular polymorphism variation in size of nuclei and shape is nuclear polymorphism. Replacement of one cell type by another, that is metaplasia. Disordered arrangement is, I can hear it, it's a dysplasia. And these are the important questions. I bet that you would have all the IMPs by now. Uh, my humble request would be to continue uh, using the same sources which you used throughout the year or in your final months for preparation. Uh, don't panic. Don't look at what others are doing or don't try to use a new source whatever you have studied just revise it well and if you find these uh, mcqs helpful do watch them at 1.5 to 2x speed as well if you want to save time and for the explanations short explanations which i gave in between do uh, give me a feedback as well if it is required or not or if there are any changes which would be required from my side i would be more than happy because trust me there's nothing as satisfying as knowing that uh, you know, these questions had done and uh, they did come in my examination. So these are the important questions, adaptations, definitions with examples of the four types. Necrosis, again, very, very important. All the, uh, you know, five types of necrosis. Calcification, again, important. Pigments, important. Free radical is a thing which you can do later if you do not have time at now or first cover the important topics. And if you still have time, then do that. Apoptosis, intrinsic versus extrinsic pathway, extremely important. I did not touch upon that because I did not find MCQs. If you find MCQs, do let me know. And the difference between necrosis and apoptosis is also very, very important. And uh, but due to paucity of time, maybe or if 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 you want to, if anyone has any doubt with regard to it, I am always available to clear it. Do let me know in the comment section below. And. Uh, as I told, uh, this has not been my uh, solo endeavor, my personal endeavor. It has been because of support of my friends as well across batches. And uh, special thanks to SJ for uh, igniting that spark to uh, help you all during your final exams. And there's a quote which is very close to my heart and it's be who you needed when you were younger. So I'll end with it. Uh, it's open to interpretation. And yeah, thank you. Keep studying and if there's anything I can help you with, do let me know.